Hello everyone, so I know I already have a few videos talking about glycolysis, but with this video it's going to be a little bit more detailed on how we take glucose all the way to pyruvate and looking at each of the enzymes in that process. First enzyme complex in glycolysis is hexokinase. Hexokinase is really important because it helps trap glucose in the cell by phosphorylating it to glucose 6-phosphate. The reason why it's called glucose 6-phosphate is because we're phosphorylating that 6-carbon on glucose. This happens by taking a phosphor group from ATP to glucose. Now, one of the interesting things about hexokinase is that within its reaction, it's actually using magnesium to help stabilize the phosphor groups on ATP and the glucose 6-phosphate. Our second enzyme complex in glycolysis is phosphohexoisomerase, turning glucose 6-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate. Now, I know this process isn't energetically favorable, but it's, the payoff is going to be worth it throughout the glycolysis. Now, this enzyme also uses magnesium to help stabilize the negative charges in the phosphoryl groups, and we're going to see that trend repeat itself with future enzymes. Now, even though all these enzyme complexes are really important, I guess put a little star next to phosphofructokinase because it's an enzyme complex in regulation between glycolysis and gluconeogenesis that we're going to be seeing a lot. Phosphofructokinase takes fructose 6-phosphate and phosphorylates it again to make it fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, more or less phosphorylating the first carbon on fructose 6-phosphate. This phosphofructokinase is really important between the fork between glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Let's talk about some of the things that can enhance and activate phosphofructokinase to turn fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, encouraging glycolysis. Now, first of all, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. I know it sounds familiar, but fructose 2,6-bisphosphate encourages phosphofructokinase to perform its reaction by binding to it. Also, the hormone insulin increases the activity of phosphofructokinase. Forming fructose 1,6-bisphosphate through phosphofructokinase, we're ready for the next enzyme complex, which is aldolase. Aldolase is going to cleave fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into two molecules, one dihydroxyacetone and two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And an interesting fact about the reaction of aldolase is that there's a really important lysine residue at the active site that's going to act as a shift base. This is more or less going to form a reverse aldolase condensation reaction. First learning about glycolysis and biochemistry, this next step can be a little confusing because after this, the majority of the products will be doubled. In the last reaction with aldolase, we formed DHAP and G3P. But G3P is the product that continues down glycolysis. But DHAP doesn't, so we need to turn DHAP into G3P, and that's where triosphosphate isomerase comes in. It's going to isomerize DHAP to G3P, so now we have two G3Ps entering the rest of the cycle, and that's why the majority of the products from here on out are going to be doubled. Next enzyme complex that we're going to be looking at is G3P dehydrogenase. Now, I just want to say that it might be helpful to go to that reaction arrow and put the insert of an inorganic phosphate. This reaction is going to be focusing on turning glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. This reaction focuses on the oxidation of the aldehyde of G3P to a carboxylic acid and hydride with a phosphoric acid. Now remember, we just formed two G3Ps, so at this step in glycolysis, we have formed two 1,3-bisphosphoglycerates. Now, G3P is one of my favorite enzymes to look at to see the importance of amino acid residues at the active site of the protein complex. And so in later videos, we're going to dive a little bit more into the importance of those amino acid residues, such as cysteine. The next step, we're looking at phosphoglycerate kinase. Now, this enzyme complex is really important because it's our first example of substrate-level phosphorylation. And the reason why it's called substrate-level phosphorylation is because the 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate that we just formed is going to transfer a phosphor group from 2-ADP to form ATP. So this is the reason why we've been creating these high-energy molecules. So phosphoglycerate kinase is going to take 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to form 3-phosphoglycerate. Now that we did our first example of substrate level phosphorylation, I want you to think that the rest of glycolysis is going to be to set up the second substrate level phosphorylation. Now the interesting thing is, 
Our next enzyme complex is phosphoglycerate mutase. This is going to take 3 phosphoglycerate to 2 phosphoglycerate, just moving the phosphoric group from the third carbon to the second carbon. After forming 2 phosphoglycerate, the enolase is going to come in to form a high energy molecule, phosphoenolpyruvate. Phosphoenolpyruvate is our second high energy, well, extremely high energy molecule in glycolysis. So now with the next step, we can perform our second substrate level phosphorylation. And the enzyme complex that's going to be responsible or taken part with the second substrate level phosphorylation is going to be pyruvate kinase. This is going to take phosphoenolpyruvate into a substrate level phosphorylation to form ATP and the product pyruvate. After we form pyruvate, there's two courses of action, whether or not we have oxygen. So for the first gateway, in a sense, we have oxygen. This is aerobic respiration. We're going to take pyruvate into the mitochondrial matrix to react with the three enzyme complex, which is huge, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. This is going to take our pyruvate all the way to acetylcholate through oxidation. Acetylcholate is then going to enter the Krebs cycle, but what happens when we are in anaerobic respiration, when there's not a lot of presence of oxygen? Now, with anaerobic conditions, this means without the presence of oxygen, there's two types of pathways, but let's talk about the one that you do. Now, you use lactate dehydrogenase. This is going to take pyruvate to lactic acid. The important part of this reaction is to keep glycolysis going by feeding it NAD+, to keep some of the important enzyme reactions going. So it's going to take pyruvate and reduce it to lactic acid. This is going to help us regenerate that NAD+, to help glycolysis keep on going. Even though we're not producing as much energy, we're still producing some. Now for the second pathway, this is what we see in yeast and other microorganisms. It has the same tone, but a little different, and the product is different as well. But it helps regenerate NAD plus to feed into glycolysis. So what this enzyme does, pyruvate decarboxylase, is the first one. This one's two steps instead of one. So pyruvate is going to react with pyruvate decarboxylase, which is going to remove CO2 to form acetaldehyde. Now, acetaldehyde is going to react with alcohol dehydrogenase, help us form NAD+, by reducing acetaldehyde to form ethanol. And this is how we get alcohol. But with that, we just finished talking all about glycolysis and all the enzymes in it, the formation of pyruvate, and what happens with pyruvate in aerobic conditions, and the two different types of anaerobic conditions. A lot of these infographics that you see that I use in this video can be purchased in my study booklet or downloaded for free over on my website. I hope this was helpful and hope you guys have a great day.